Okay, so moving into um, the decks that the are, work of the, the the artwork of the creator who made who made the deck that are a much more sort of um, recognizable system. So as I said before, things that um, are definitely using, say, the Marseille system or the RWS or are thoth informed. Um, that when you look at them, you can absolutely see that it's a very distinctive approach on the part of the creator. Um, and absolutely is all of it their style and so on, um, but that you do recognize elements of the system and can use it if you're familiar with those systems. So the first three are my three um, uh, Deviant Moon Ink decks, Patrick Valenza decks. Um, the first that I will show is my Triomphi della Luna Paradoxical Blue um, edition. Those of you who have seen some of my other videos will know that I was dithering a lot about finding a way or thinking about acquiring this deck and what was I going to do with the fact that I had acquired the um, uh, Illustrated Pips edition of the Paradoxical. And um, the answer to that is I ended up getting this because this is the one I wanted basically. Um, obviously ideally I would like the black, the original classic Paradoxical, but basically I actually think the blue is stunning. It has a really good direct medieval link for me, um, which I really enjoy. Um, and I was finding um, the illustrated pips, although beautiful, just very, very difficult to look at. I think, to be honest, the sensory experience of them was just a bit muddling for me, and it wasn't working um, sort of more long term. I kind of took the deck out repeatedly, see how I felt, draw cards, look at it, and it's just, it's going to need to move on. But I have to sort of figure out how I want to do that. Um, so you'll notice here, what I've actually done with this, um, is instead of the Major Arcana, which I have inside the box, I, um, I've i swapped out the um, Beast Pack and they are currently functioning as the Major Arcana in this deck. Um, uh, for reasons that actually tie into the decks that are on their way currently, um, but I'll mention that in a bit. It has to do with little creatures. And things. Uh, I also have the um, Triomphi della Luna non-paradoxical original with the red backs and the beautiful sort of um, more cooled down somber melancholy colors rather than a straight up um, very primary set of Marseille color associations um, which I really enjoy. Um, Patrick Valenza's work is very obviously historically quite well informed so, um, I really, really like it. And last Patrick Valenza deck is my Deviant Moon Paradoxical, which I have mentioned in a video ages ago um, on the notion of uh, creepy art, which again will be linked below, but this for me is a very sort of um, where the weird ones dwell kind of deathy astral deck. Uh, very, very trippy. Um, such a mood. Um, and for me, a lot more like what my world looks like in terms of like how I respond to color and how intense it makes me feel rather than the sort of very industrial set of colors of the um, original uh, Deviant Moon Tarot. So there you have it. Um, okay, so moving on to two decks um, in this category that are on kind of uneasy terms with me. Um, I keep I keep keeping them in my collection um, because I have I can't quite make up my mind, and until I've made up my mind um, on them, I consider myself as like them being in my collection. I own them; they are part of the collection. Um, I suspect it's going to require a lot of very distinctive exploration and a much more intense personal set of associations with the decks. Um, but yeah, so the first is the um, Aquarian Tarot in a bag that I actually made myself. Like I, I made the bag extra quirky because I wanted it to be like a standout kind of bag rather than my usual um, drawstring and ribbons kind of technique. Um, so this is not, you know, a new deck to anybody um, really. Um, And, you know, I think the issue for me is, like, I, I, I genuinely love this. I don't find that it's overwhelming, for example, when I'm neurologically overstimulated. It is a beautiful set of very autumnal uh, colors. 
Um, it also has a very sort of um, storybook uh, vibe. I think, you know, it's a very well-informed deck from an art historical perspective. We have a little bit of the Art Nouveau look, but also a very Art Deco kind of look. Um, and all of that, like, kind of sings to me. But I think the issue is more um, that I... One of the reasons I do want it in my collection is because I want a represent representation in my collection of that 1970s does the Middle Ages, um, does tarot, does spiritual stuff kind of aesthetic, um, because that is a huge part, say, for example, of how I inform some of my clothing choices and so on. So it's a way of talking to myself about those things. But I just always end up picking up a slightly more historical deck um, for the most part. Like, I struggle a little bit with some of the more, like, lighthearted or um, easier going deck systems. So again, I need to kind of ask myself more about that one. And then the other one is the Medieval Scapini Tarot, which I've had for a long time and it was in like time out. Like I was gonna move it on for ages and now I'm just kind of like, I don't think I gave it a proper chance and that upsets me. So um, here, Vex, which I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar with. And, uh, by the way, is this not, like, one of the cutest death cards you've ever seen? Look at that! It's so cute! Um, I think, to be honest, for me, this deck is going to be a lot about, um, very, very detailed, almost pathwork, pathworking kind of stuff, along with, um, certain art historical, like this one, for example, um, uh, uh has a very sort of, um, medieval informed, uh, obviously it's in the name as well, um, arrangement on the card, but then also my own personal sort of color theory associations, I think, is going to be the way forward with this deck. And initially I was considering letting it go, mainly because um, the artwork is so small that I was getting a little bit irritated when I couldn't discern what was being depicted on the card. But I think a little bit more effort on my part will address that issue. Okay, so moving on. I have here the larger version, because it's not trimmed, of the Solara Occulto Tarot um, with the weird starry backs. It's not currently getting a lot of use from me, mainly because of these backs. They give me sensory problems. Um, they actually kind of feel like bright flashlights in my face. Um, so I need to get myself a, um, I think I'm going to do a Copic marker and just black out the backs a bit more. But uh, I've talked about this deck before, um, I think in a Connect the Decks quote-unquote episode, so I will not talk about it too much right now, and obviously, hopefully at some point, I'll do sort of more in-depth um, video projects with the art in this deck, because I do have some ideas. Next is the um, La Corte de Tarocchi uh, by the El Manigello, um Studio which is a great deck, I actually think, for cramped spaces. Um, like, if you have a smaller altar, it's really nice to um, work with this deck in that capacity because you can fit a lot of images in a small space. Um, and I just think the actual, like, it's got a very sort of Byzantine-informed um, look to it, which I really enjoy sort of more early medieval aesthetic in certain ways and um, who doesn't need more of that in their lives, you know? The owl on the box is just too cute. Look at it. A uh, deck that I've covered in a recent video, The Murder of Crows Tarot. Um, uh, so I won't go into it now, but you know what it looks like. I showed a bunch of it in a recent video. Link in the description. Um, again, sort of RWS informed uh, deck system, but obviously the beautiful art of Corrado Roy, or Roy, Roy, I can't say it. Um, and then we have the Joie de Vivre Tarot by Paulina Cassidy, which has been getting used. It's really interesting, I've been using it to explore um, that notion of slightly less complicated joy, um, ch sense of childhood play, inner child work, but very specifically in terms of how it helps me loosen up about my own artistic explorations. Um, and to be honest, a little bit of a color inspiration as well. Um, I really enjoy the sort of watercolor approach um, to the images in, in this deck. The sort of um, emotional seriousness and emo like you know, taking um, everything from a perspective of respecting the emotions of the characters in the cards, um, 
while retaining that sense of sort of childhood or childishness, and I, I enjoy that, or childlike nature, I should say. Um, that's something that's been bringing me a lot of benefit in terms of my own art practice and my own um, way of living and emotional well-being. On the sort of slightly opposite side of that spectrum, but also part of, very much part of the same thing, I have the Somnia Tarot, which um, the impetus behind acquiring it originally was definitely because I am intensely nightmarish. I have nightmares all the time. Um, thankfully a little less frequently at the moment, but you know, my, they'll, they'll come again. They're never that far off. And I've had some experiences with sleep paralysis, although to be honest, um, some of those have been really cool. Um, but yeah, basically sleep is very uneasy territory for me. It, I'm not great at it. Um, and I just find this deck really, really comforting, really easygoing, and just nice to be in. Um, partly because it talks to me about that world, but in, in like a way that isn't rushed. You need to take your time. There is like, although the deck is very serious and very dark and according to some very creepy, it's definitely also not a rushed experience. You um, move only ever as fast as you need and it doesn't shout at you in the process, which is good. Uh, covered extensively on this channel, the Pagan Otherworlds Tarot by uh, Usi, um, so I'm not gonna cover it here. Um, because I've got like five videos dedicated to this deck, so everyone knows I have it, or everyone who's seen this channel anyway. Uh, next deck is um, in a Me Made bag, as many of my decks are. Um, and it is the Ritual Tarot by Tierra May. Um, which has a very um, sort of religious, but like, informed by personal experience um, component to me. Obviously, like as with this card, there are certain ones that are within the art historical uh, time periods and geographical regions that I have a lot of interest in. Um, I do obviously enjoy the very inherent mythic quality of this deck, but there are also specific cards that evoke a very personal emotional set of memories that are like good, but also like in need of a little bit of a tweaking or a revisiting um, that are kind of um, at least to my mind depicted in this deck, and I um, have been really enjoying that. But I will say that the progress with this deck is very slow. Um, I think partially because I do find it a bit of an emotionally very intense experience to work with this deck. Um, but I have, like, I, I think there's merit in that. Some decks taking a, lo a lot longer to familiarize yourself with doesn't necessarily denote infrequency of use or um, lack of connection. Um, and then last deck in this category um, is just an exquisite artistic experience and one that's actually bringing me a lot of very distinct healing. It's a deck that I've noticed that I've gravitated towards when I'm feeling very fragile and insecure um, but in a way that needs to kind of acknowledge that fragility and insecurity and talk to me about it. Um, and the deck also has a very distinct celebratory nature. Um, to it, which I appreciate as well. So it is the um, Dust to Onyx Tarot by um, Courtney Alexander. Um, I have the travel-sized edition, um, mainly for budgeting reasons and also for shipping overseas reasons. It was quite difficult to get it to me initially. Yeah. Also, has anyone noticed the death spin on the bottom of the decks repeatedly in this video? I'm not sad about that. Um, so yeah, it's obviously a rightly so um, famous deck and I've only begun to scratch the surface of it and I have been using it um, all, quite often just at the altar. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't ever stray too far away from the altar. Um, and yeah, I think everything from the deep darkness of the backgrounds, the jewel tones, the emotional expression in all of the faces, um, the sense of movement in this deck, um, sort of shimmering, swift, um, spatially oriented movement is something that I really love about it. Um, and like I said, it, journey very much ongoing, and I'm really enjoying it. It's also kind of 
Although it's rose petal finish, it's, it's for me anyway, it's a delight to shuffle. It makes the most beautiful sound. Okay, so moving on to the last category of decks, I have six decks remaining to cover. Um, so I'll get right into it. And the first deck is, um, this is in a bag I made, uh, the Marielle Tarot. And actually, I do want to mention about this one, what I'm noticing over time is, I think actually, oh, I don't remember what video it was in, but I think um, Julie over at Peekaboo Rose um, mentioned in one of her videos that there are specific decks that she has where she doesn't mind if she needs to use the guidebook with it, kind of ever and anon forevermore with it. Um, which is like a really interesting idea um, because normally I think a lot of us are someone who, do, do, like people who don't really, especially if it's a little white book, don't use it at all. Um, but I actually do find that there's a lot, of, when, a, when a guidebook is good, a guidebook is good. And I also think that that's crucial to the worldview of certain decks. So with the Marielle, I certainly, I'm going to be in Julie's camp where it's like, I will never not use the guidebook with this deck. Um, so instead of just talking, I'll show you the cards like a proper tarot tuber, which I'm pretty sure we can all agree I am not at this point. Um, but yeah, so this is that like um, smaller uh, later edition um, and it's also the one that got recalled as I've mentioned before. It's got the um, black edging um, which has definitely been wearing away uh, with shuffling but like I said um, I shuffle my decks quite frequently and I Find this one's a delight to shuffle. Um, and I think I heard somewhere that the Silver Gilded uh, edition of this edition, Silver Gilded issue of this edition of the deck, um, gets it a bit, bit of a bend or a bowing in the cards um, uh, over time. And I have found that that is not the case with my mezzanine, like awkward me mezzanine edition of this deck. Um, surprisingly, some, some of my decks um, I do have to kind of work, do gentle work with to sort of re-straighten from time to time, and so far this deck, no. Um, next is the ever-amazing Hush Tarot. Um, as I have said before, I have an entire video um, exploring uh, the inspiration relatedness of this art to uh, the work of Arthur Rackham. Um, exploring image composition, uh, color and ink choice and composition because Jeremy Hush, I understand, makes his own inks, um, as well as um, movement and sort of format and printing techniques um, uh, from different time periods and so on. And so yeah, I have a whole video on this deck and um, it's still easily one of my most used decks. It's just... I, I, I actually can't even put my finger on it entirely because there are cards in the deck that aren't really my favorite. I'm not a very sort of pink and unicorns kind of person. Um, or pink and ponies and carousel rides. It's not really, I don't know if you can tell, but it's not really my vibe. But as I think you can also tell anyone who would have watched my channel, there's a little bit of a tricky area for me around those sorts of things and ideas of um, gender normative girlishness and the disrespect that we tend to have for that culturally. Uh, in terms of how we treat um, cisgendered uh, women that are younger in our society, not in terms of um, how we shoehorn people into cisgendered identities, just to be clear about that. Um, it has a lot to do with how we um, have a tendency to disrespect things that, for example, tend to be considered feminine things. And I also think that there's very much a capacity, and I often use it in this way, for a very sort of deathy Gnostic approach to healing the inner child, if that makes any sense. If that's not like the most me sentence I think I've ever said, then I don't know what it is. What what is. Uh, but there you go. Um, deathy Gnostic healing of the inner child. Uh, and that's the Lush Tarot. <laughs> I have here the Witch's Wisdom Tarot, and these are the backs. But the artwork done by the ever effervescent, amazing Danielle Barlow. The deck itself and Danielle Barlow's art is stunning. And I do like the ways in which the sort of system has been turned on its head 
Um, so that in terms of our associations of the major arcana, numerically speaking, they kind of progress backwards if we think of the normal order of proceedings. And what that does in terms of limbering up your mind and responding to the imagery in front of you is a beautiful thing in that deck. So I love the deck, I just don't love the guidebook. And I find the deck functions just fine on its own without the guidebook. It, it, doesn't need the guidebook. Uh, next deck is the Tarot of Mystical Moments by Katrine Wellstein. Um, let focus. And this deck I've noticed, again, I don't tend to have mood decks per se. I use whatever deck whenever, but that does mean that I tend to um, notice if there's a frequency of use associated with a certain mood or a certain type of question or whatever else, you know, um, a certain need. Um, a certain theme. This is one of my favorite death cards, by the way. Um, I'm all about this idea of like the the blossoming from death. Um, death blossoms. Um, it's a big, big, big death positive uh, vibe attitude for me. It's a mood. But anyway, uh, I tend to use this deck, I've noticed, when essentially I want to I suppose you could say it's the closest I have to a hug deck. As someone who doesn't care for hugs, who engages in hugs very much as a gesture for somebody else rather than something I am particularly keen on participating in, and if I had better willpower would say no to all hugs except for those from my partner, um, uh, and better reactivity in the moment I suppose. Um, uh, I don't think of hug decks as a thing. But I do think of comfort, and I do think of um, things like tell me who I am, reaffirm the way my imagination works, um, tell it to me in ways that I can digest, that don't exclude triggers, that don't sugarcoat it, but that do aid in slightly more immediate and magical and celebratory understandings. Um, also, as for example with this card, that have a, a very distinct mythic approach. Um, so it's like, talk to me using a language my brain uses all the time equals hug deck, I suppose. But you know, like, again, as, as a neurodivergent person, as an autistic person, I struggle quite frequently with a sense of losing identity. Um, losing sense of my personality. I get very quickly overwhelmed by other humans in person um, and I struggle to remember my own sense of priority and the way in which my inner landscape looks and works. So a visual reminder in times of overwhelm is really really valuable in my collection and arguably that's how all of tarot works for me. But I think from a perspective of like just dropping the shoulders and bringing a sense of ease, not lack of challenge, just like overall lessened anxiety levels in the face of something, this deck is a really good um, go-to in that regard. And that's purely just from noticing when I have a tendency to pick up the deck. Um, again, not exclusive, I use it for other things too, but there's a definite prevalence for that there. Okay, slight change of the lighting situation. This is starting to look very, very orange in the camera, so hopefully this is a little better. Uh, second to last deck, the Carnival at the End of the World Tarot. Um, I actually have an idea uh, for a video percolating with this deck. Um, a kind of, I don't know if I would call it a Connect the Decks episode, but more of like a, again, a little bit like a deep dive, but in the style of ways that I tend to do things where I get probably quite likely needlessly pedantic about it. But there's been a recurring thing in, in the readings um, with this deck that I've done that um, is something that I think would be fun to explore in video format, so that hopefully at some point, once I kind of get clear on, on the actual ideas myself, hopefully will be a video in the coming year. But this deck definitely very much slots into that whole, like, give me a whole realm of weirdos. I need friends in the tarot realm. A lot of my decks um, seek to exist in that sort of niche in the metaphysical world, in the metaphysical world, drops cards. Um, and um, 
I think whatever I end up doing video wise with this deck is definitely going to be an in conjunction with the guidebook kind of exploration because the guidebook is attitude and comedy gold. Oh, it's like they're, they're, they're just, they're, they are one and the same and it's amazing. Even though they're not, you don't actually need the guidebook, not required, but it's amazing. Last deck currently in my possession that has not, you know, excluding the ones that have yet to arrive, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, this is by far my most recent acquisition. I purchased it literally um, earlier this week on Sunday. I was out with some friends uh, for brunch and then we were walking around Cork City Center and at a certain point I socially maxed out so I basically said hey I'm gonna go ahead to the local witchy shop um, while they were in another place and so I did and entered the quiet of that shop knowing that this was likely to be in stock knowing that I had kind of over recent weeks and months told myself maybe the next time I go in there I'll be picking this up. So once I went in and knew that I had officially re-entered the shop <laughs> since the last time I had been there, I made a beeline for the deck and bought it. And um, so it's the Margaret Peterson Tarot. And I uh, had been considering this for quite some time. Um, obviously, I think because of the um, sort of art deck association, I wanted something that would feel a bit more um, conducive to the way I might respond to things like color, shape, color theory, um, sort of an impressionist, a mentally impressionist response, like call and response to a deck. Um, so almost functioning in the way certain oracle decks function, I suppose, um, except that with the tarot structure and with a really distinct, I suppose, again, like mythic or astral kind of um, approach to the imagery. Um, I have read the uh, main sections of the guidebook already, and um, it's just one of those things where like what people say in a sentence the thing that you didn't realize other people experienced, and I think that's a really lovely thing, um, again, especially as an autistic person. Um, it's really valuable for me when I realize that like, obviously I know that like the way the human brain works statistically, I'm not the only one to experience certain things. But the level of affirmation that um, I feel when um, something puts something that I've experienced in words so beautifully um, is not only very important to anybody, but it's not something that's happened very frequently in my life. And I value it already just for the guidebook. But then um, I took my time going through each image first before shuffling the deck and then um, didn't even do a reading straight away either. And part of the reason I'm saying that, instead of just whizzing through the deck, is that um, I think the speed that one goes about this deck, similar to some of the other ones I've mentioned, is very slow, very paced, taking time to notice the details in the images, as anyone who I'm sure is familiar with this deck would, would say. Um, and what was interesting about that is that um, I've been rereading um, slowly, taking my time, because I don't, I can't even tell you how many times I've read these books. I've been rereading, this is my travel copy, um, the Earthsea material. So I finished um, I finished uh, The Tombs of Atuan the other day, um, which if I had to pick a favorite in the six books and the added short stories might be my favorite book, but mm, that's a tall order um, because there is no such thing as a favorite when it comes to the um, Earthsea books. Um, but anyway, I finished Tombs of Atuan and was feeling, as I often do, very, very sort of raw and emotional and identifying hardcore with certain things, for example, that Tenar um, was experiencing, um, thinking about the overall trajectory of the books and revisiting these times almost like they're memories now, um, even though they're not because they're happening on the page. Like I was just having a really spiritually significant, um, almost um, path working to the level of being there with the characters as we so often do when we're reading fiction. Um, but anyway, I was having that experience having just finished the book. You know that you've just closed the book after the end of a novel kind of feeling. And that was the moment that I picked up the Margaret Peterson Tarot and did my first reading. And part of the reason that happened is not only because it was on the table next to me, but also because as I was going through the cards, I was like, this is an earth seed deck. There are so many images that are in visual format how my brain feels 
when reading the Earthsea materials. I don't know if that's going to make sense to anyone as a sentence, but I, it's, it's just the second I started flip, flip, flipping through the deck the first time, um, I was like, I'm, you know, I'm going to need to use this in tandem with my sacred text, which is all of the Earthsea materials. Um, and, you know, insofar as the Earthsea books actually do contain a lot of very, what I would consider, you know, medieval influenced um, sort of, you know, or, or I suppose Renaissance, if we think of things like Italian city-states and so on, and um, textile trades and all that kind of thing, um, the books also possess a very distinct mythic story component. Um, there are certain cards in here, um, you know, daughter, the Daughter of Feathers make me think of, t of Tenar, um, and to a certain extent Tahanu, and there is another card that make me think of the Festival of Sun Return in the books. Um, there's cards that make me think of the dry land and the wall. Um, for example, this one literally right here. You know, peaceful ways of asking ourselves those questions. Um, for example, this here, the Seven of Cups, is that not look far, hitting the sand that is not sand that's in the middle of the ocean that is not the ocean in pursuit of the shadow? Is that not a look far card? It's just, anyway, so you get the idea. I, um, I'm, I'm gushing too much about this deck now in what's already admittedly a very long video, likely. Um, but you get the idea. There's just this um, sense of Earthsea in this deck. And I will have no argument. <laughs> So anyway, at some point I'll have to make a video trying to approach the topic of like how and why the earthy materials are my sacred text and so on, but that day is not today. It is not this day. So anyway, there you go. Um, again, this is just the travel copy of the first four books, but Margaret Peterson Tarot and Earthsea is how I've like been introduced to this deck and now they're just permanently meshed together as a unit in my head. So, um, I'll leave it there. Oh, no, I will um, mention the, the decks that I have coming. I have two of Lennon Smith's decks in the post on their winging their way to me, and I'm super, super excited. They are the, um, oh goodness, I can't remember their names off the top of my head. I'll put the names here on the screen. Um, I can't wait. Her choices for the images in both are just exquisite, and I'm like ready, ready, ready to have them. So they're on the way. And then I also have um, an Oracle deck coming that I made myself, that I made on um, make playing cards that um, I wanted for meditative purposes, pathworking purposes, certain astral aspects, servitor aspects, if you want to use that term, a little bit of a chaos magic kind of approach, along with a histor historical aesthetic, which I will probably share, assuming I ever feel it's ready to share um, on this channel. So I won't share it right now, but. Um, yeah, basically, um, uh, that's what I've got on the way, and who knows when they'll arrive, because tracking is, like, not great here. And I can't wait, and I've been waiting for a while, so hopefully they'll get here soon. So that should be everything now. I'm going to stop talking and sign off. Hopefully this video has been of use, has been interesting to watch anyway. Um, Hopefully I have explained some of my process and, you know, um, laid things out in a way that is vaguely clear and not too rambly. I wish everyone, uh, I won't say happy holidays um, unless you do celebrate something at this time of year, um, but enjoy, enjoy the impending midwinter. Um, lean into the whole um, icy, icy snow queen vibes. And uh, I hope everyone is doing well, taking care of themselves to the best of their ability, and I'll see you all next time. Bye! Um, oh, I'm not gonna... I shouldn't play with this too much, should I? Mess with the lighting of my...